Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 25th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We have apologies from Richard Lyle. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 5, 6 and 7 in private. Are we all agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. Um, the second item of business uh, today is to hear evidence from the Scottish Land Commission. I welcome Andrew Thun, the Chair, Dr Sally Reynolds, one of the Commissioners, and Hamish, Hamish Trench, the Chief Executive. Welcome to you all. Members have a series of questions, as you can imagine, and we're going to move direct to the questions. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was reading in our information that since spring 2017, the Land Commission has held a series of public meetings across different places, including Dumfries and Bigger in the South Scotland region, where I represent. So I'm curious what the key themes were that emerged from the meetings. Was there a difference across all areas? And was there a difference in themes from urban and rural areas? I will answer that, Kavina, if that's all right, because I've uh, attended all of them. Um, so first of all, uh, the, the, the broad message is that uh, um, right across Scotland, there's an enormous interest in the subject. Uh, the awareness is not uh, all that high, I think, as to, as, as to the breadth of the subject. Um, and attending the meetings has been an extraordinarily diverse audience with people interested in just about everything. Um, the, in the urban context, the predominant issue has been about housing and about land for housing. Uh, vacant and derelict land, how do we make more of it? Um, in the rural areas, the predominant uh, issues have been um, community ownership, as you might expect, but also, I think, uh, a, a strong theme around uh, an aspiration to have uh, closer dialogue, co closer consultation between landowners and people who live on and around land and who are affected by those decisions. So, so in a sense, I don't think any of that surprised us. Um, there were also some quite strong uh, feedback about common good land. Uh, in, in, for example, I was in Clyde Bank the other night, a uh, very strong theme in Clyde, Clyde Bank. I don't quite know why it's strong in Clyde Bank, um, a strong theme there. Um, quite, quite a lot about access legislation, the 2003 Act, actually, more than I expected around that, uh, uh, particularly in rural areas, but not just in rural areas. Um, but. You know, as a what I've taken away in the round from all that is f fundamental to what we're in, what 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 we have to achieve here, is we have to achieve a Scotland that's more at ease with itself, that's more comfortable with itself, uh, and that the the relationship between the people who own and manage land in Scotland with the rest of us needs needs to be a, a more constructive, more uh, more more collaborative one than it is at the moment. Okay. Were there any um, particularly unex unexpected issues that were brought up, and how did that inform you? And after all this information gathering, which will continue, uh, how will that inform the way you will move forward with your work programme? Um, I don't think there were any particular issues that were unexpected. The emphasis at times was unexpected. Stronger emphasis, for example, in some parts of the country on land value taxation, but that may have been organised, I think there may have been some organised effort to, to, to behind that. Um, but that, I certainly hadn't anticipated such a strong thrust on that. Um, the other perhaps unexpected thing, uh, for example, I held a, uh, one of these meetings in Leith in Edinburgh, um, had not expected quite such a strong level of concern about um, uh, la uh, land assembly for housing, uh, uh, the, 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 the real concern that, that individuals were able to obstruct and block uh, housing developments that the council had already zoned and approved, you know, it was all there, but, but, we, but, but, but the council didn't have the, 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 the tools to pull it together. I, hadn't, I kind of knew that was an issue, especially in Glasgow, 
But I hadn't expected quite such strong public opinion on that. Um, in terms of what it will do, well, I hope you can, I mean, you'll see these themes already coming through in the work programme uh, which we've published. That work programme is going to be a moving feast. It will evolve uh, over time. But the themes are coming through. All of that is published back out on our website, so there's a, it's a two-way street. We have these meetings. It then will inform the evolution of that work programme. That goes back out so people can see exactly what's happening and, and how their views are then influencing what we do. Thanks. Can I ask um, how academia has been able to feed into this process? Has it been through these meetings, or is it? Are you engaging with academia separately? I may pass to Hamish. He can talk about it. Um, yes, I mean we're we're engaging them <coughs> really through a separate series of meetings. <coughs> we held a we held a, our conference last week where we launched the strategic plan. A uh, number of academic representatives there, amongst the 160 attendees. Uh, we're also having separate meetings uh, with the. Uh, the collection of research institutes that forms the Scottish Government Safari uh, Land Use Research Institute group. Um, and uh, we're also in touch with the universities uh, Scotland about uh, collaborating. Uh, there are potential roles, for example, for PhD uh, work to contribute to the work programme, uh, for contract uh, research uh, through academic uh, institutions. But I'd emphasise as well that the, the research we intend to carry out, I think some of it will be appropriate for academic institutions to, to play a role. Um, but some of it will also be appropriate for, for other uh, wider um, contractors uh, to, to play a role in delivering that. Okay, thanks. Finlay Carson. Thanks, Kevira. Just going back to, you mentioned that the land value tax had, had come up and it, it's, it's developed the tag recently in, in the media, this garden tax. Can I ask what your response is to that and, and uh, what will the Commission, or what part will that play in the Commission's ongoing uh, work programme and strategic, strategic plan? Uh, I'll, I'm just going to pass to Hemish, but let me be clear, we have, we have no preconceptions or pre-conclusions pre on this at all. We are going to investigate the subject in a very thorough way, but Hemish will tell you a wee bit more about where our thinking is. It's early days. Yes, I mean, clearly we've been asked to look at land value-based tax options. Um, the thinking at the moment is our work will start by looking at uh, the ways in which land value taxes have been uh, used elsewhere uh, around the world. Uh, not just looking at the, the set of options, but actually the drivers behind those, understanding why they were put in place and the implications, both intended and unintended, um, so that we get a real picture of how they operate. Uh, and I think we'll also want to look at the practicalities in terms of what kind of data would be required, um, how such an approach could be put in place uh, if it was considered appropriate uh, in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. Mark Roscoe. Thanks, convener. Um, there's obviously quite a lot of stakeholder discussion uh, around post-Brexit agricultural subsidies at the moment, which arguably could have as much of an impact as land ownership going forward in terms of how we use land and what, what land is for. But can I ask you, how have you been interfacing with the agriculture champions that have been set up by the Cabinet Secretary and the Council of Rural Advisors? Have they approached you? Have you approached them? Uh, so, very, relatively little direct formal interaction. Uh, it is early days. Um, uh, indirectly and informally, there's a huge amount of dialogue going on between people involved in the Commission, one way or the other, and people uh, in these other organisations. Uh, it is absolutely essential that we all, you know, we're all on the same page as we go forward here. Um, I'm not sh whether. I don't anticipate the Commission having a, a formal contribution to put into that. Uh, why not? Um, because uh, I, I think it would be duplication, to be honest. I think it, it seems you know, the, the government has set up a different mechanism to address the, uh, the, the uh, Brexit, the implications for agriculture and so on. Uh, and I'm not sure that it would be necessarily helpful for us to, to focus quite scarce resources on duplicating that work. Is there not a danger that there are competing visions, though? No, not if we talk to each other, no. I, I think, as I say, it is essential we are all on the same page. It's therefore, the, therefore essential by implication that there is no conflict of vision. But the, the detailed work and the detailed recommendations come, need to come, I think, through the channels that have been set up. Okay. Convener, if I could add to that. Um, I think Brexit obviously features most prominently in relation to the agriculture stream in our work programme. Um, and we had the first meeting of the Tenant Farming Advisory Forum just a couple of weeks ago, 
uh, where the theme of Brexit was explored at the, the top of the agenda there. So we're making the connections in terms of keeping under review the implications of Brexit, particularly for farm tenure. Um, but as Andrew says, we won't be leading um, kind of response and, and ideas on, uh, on, the, on the mainstream Brexit work there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Mr. Convener, um, good morning to the panel. If, um, if I could maybe touch on some of the operational issues and resources. Um, we know that SLC has been awarded a budget of 1.4 million over the, the period 2017-18. Uh, so would you say the Commission has uh, sufficient resources to carry out its work both now and uh, to allow it to meet the objectives set out in your strategic plan? Uh, yes, I would. Um, clearly, we're in an establishment year this year. Um, we are still recruiting staff, for example. We have further recruitment to go over the next six months. Um, but we have developed a budget looking sort of three years ahead um, based on that level of funding, uh, which we anticipate is, is appropriate to deliver the work programme. Um, that pans out in, in a sort of work programme allocation of 550,000 um, a year uh, looking ahead to next year, um, which is sufficient to, to start delivering on the work programme. Okay, if you did end up with an underspend, which is uh, maybe likely, maybe not, um, what would happen to the funds uh, from that underspend? Would it be returned to the government or uh, would it be allocated elsewhere? Uh, well, in the, in the normal way, um, if we're underspending, the funds would be reallocated um, by the Scottish Government, um, but that would be a matter of discussion between us and, and Scottish Government leading up to the year end to, to look at uh, where we're going to come into land on the budget. I think this year, um, this year, it is likely that there will be an underspend given that we're in an establishment year and haven't had the full expenditure on staff and research from, from the start of the financial year. Um, but we're in discussions with them about uh, next year's budget and being on a, uh, you know, as, as per set out in terms of the, the 1.4 in budget in the plan. Okay, um, you mentioned um, that you're still recruiting, uh, presumably support staff. Uh, I think the figure is eight that you're, you're looking for in total. Um, with regard to capacity, would you anticipate increasing that number of support staff in the future? As of yesterday, we have nine staff um, right. uh, employed by the Commission, uh, shortly about to start recruitment for two further policy officers who will take a lead role in delivering the work programme that's set out. Um, I would anticipate that core staff you know, could, could rise 12 to 15 in the foreseeable future, but actually I think um, once we've got those two posts in place, a uh, significant amount of work will also be done by uh, fixed-term, uh, short-term contracts, bringing in the right specialists and expertise where we need it. Okay, thank you. Um, just moving on to, to, to the commissioners, um, clearly you, you all work uh, part-time. Um, would you say there's capacity for um, all the commissioners to carry out their duties, to, given the, the, the time constraints? Um, well, I'll, I'll admit that it takes a little bit more than two days a month, which was what we signed up for. Um, but so far, I think we are all managing to make the time. And we do share the roles out. So you'll notice I didn't answer your first question regarding the meet and greets, because that's not something I've done so far. But we've shared it out and I've done other duties. So I think we are managing so far, and I hope we'll continue to do so. So how many days is it a month so far? Um, at least double. Shall okay. we leave it at that? OK, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr Reynolds, you, you may recall when the full commission was in front of the committee previously, we explored whether there were any conflicts of interest that had been identified by members. And I think at that point, one member indicated they had had one and taken the appropriate action. As you've drilled down into the job and really kind of look at what it might entail, have there been other conflicts of interest that have arisen for members and how were those resolved? Um, I don't think we've had any conflicts to date. Um, we've, we've attended training and we have discussed this in great detail and we've discussed the potential for conflicts. So, for example, with myself, with crofting. Um, but I think we've managed to deal with them all and I don't think we've had to have any declared at meetings to date. Yeah, I, I just want to through, uh, make certain that all board members have had full training in this and, and it is important uh, through the on-board training. Um, the one other area which was not identified in the hearing um, is in relation to David Adams' role at Glasgow University because we anticipate uh, making use of academic institutions to do work, and uh, which might include uh, mm -hmm. Glasgow University, but whether it does or not, frankly, there is a perception issue there. So that, that but we've, we have absolutely spent a lot of time talking about that and we're on top of it. Okay, good, good to get that on the record. Uh, Kate Forbes. 
very much. So you state in the um, strategic plan that land reform is not a single event, it's a process and the strategic plan defines it as the legislative policy and cultural framework within which land is owned, managed and used. Does the Commission intend to focus on legislation and policy on one hand um, when it comes to land reform or on cultural change and if cultural change is part of that, what does cultural change actually look like? Uh, I'll start this, but actually I think we've possibly all got something to say on this. It's a really important theme. Um, th there is no question that we will uh, put a lot of effort into conducting research, doing thorough reviews and producing evidence-based recommendations for government on legislation and policy. That will be a core bit of our work. But I think we are now clear, in, and more clear than we were when we were last in this room, that non-statutory leadership uh, is a very important function for this organisation. Um, uh, now, we, if we look at what's happened in relation to Ag Holdings over the last three years, what we saw was very quickly after the Ag Holdings Review in 2014, government put in place a non statutory mechanism, which was me actually, um, to produce codes and guidance and all the rest, which were entirely voluntary. But, 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 but more than just producing codes and guidance, to get off your, my backside and get round and, just, and, and, and lead and talk to people. Um, what does it look like? It looks like changes in behaviour and changes in attitude. And I think most people who work in this area say, now they, maybe they're just being nice to me, but I don't think so. Most people who work in the agricultural holdings area are telling me that, that behaviours are changing, that attitudes are changing, that expectations are changing, not because of changes in the law, but because of all, all, all that work. Now, I think we can extend those principles out to all sorts of other areas. It may involve... Uh, guidance, it may involve um, uh, codes of practice, but the board will, will be sitting down and thinking that through in a thorough strategic way before we jump into it. There are parallels. The Deer Commission a few years ago, some will remember this, launched a best practice program, which was entirely voluntary, which was actually quite effective. And uh, we're going to ask someone from the Deer Commission to come and talk to us about that. Um, so I don't exactly know what it will look like, but I'm clear that the Commission uh, has a really important non statutory leadership role going forward. Um, you might very briefly want to hear from the other two on the same subject. Thank you. Um, we held our conference uh, last week to launch our strategic plan, and I actually laid on the accountability workshop in the afternoon, which was really interesting. It was a wide range of stakeholders and interested members of the public that attended. And I was shuffling through my notes to find my opening from that workshop. And the two things that I wrote down in the morning from the conference from different speakers, and one was achieving the bigger picture requires cultural change. And the second one was good practice should be celebrated and spread. And that was something that came through from the workshop. They felt that they, they wanted to know what good practice was and they wanted to move forward with this kind of, not over-regulation, but kind of codes of practice and methods and ways to move forward. So I hope that we'll be able to help with that. And, and I hope you'll be able to see in the programme of work that there are areas that we've identified already where we think some of this uh, approach will work. So, for example, vacant and derelict land uh, or charitable land ownership status are, are two examples where we think there's scope for guidance, um, perhaps codes, um, and certainly better collaboration to actually make a difference on the ground, uh, even while we're taking forward some of the longer-term work uh, in terms of the research and, and longer-term recommendations. Okay. Uh, Mark Roscoe. I mean, do you see a challenge in working with different types of communities here to affect cultural change? So what I'm seeing at the moment, particularly community right to buy, is that you know, more articulate communities, good resources will drive forward and establish best practice, but then there are many other communities that are being left behind. So I don't know how you can tailor your approach to, to supporting communities that are perhaps in very different places at the moment. There's no question that there's a, a big challenge. Why I'm really anxious that the board thinks this through carefully and we don't just dive in and start producing codes all over the place, although we may produce some, in, some interim guidance and codes just to keep things moving. 
Um, there's no, no question in my mind that confidence building, capacity building will be an integral part of it in some parts of the country, especially in urban Scotland where awareness is low, um, uh, there's less of a history of this sort of thing. Um, equally within the landowning community, we, we have managed to build very quickly a really constructive relationship with Scottish land and estates. But of course, there are a lot of landowners who are not members of Scottish lands and estates. Uh, so we've got to reach them. I was uh, uh, sat down with David Johnson, the chairman of SLE, on Friday to talk through how he can help me reach, reach the, 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 the landowners who are not his members, because he can help. Um, because they may not be members, but they probably know each other. It's not a big world. Um, he's going to help me try and reach some of some, land, some of the landowners who are resident in London, uh, which I think would be enormously helpful. So that you know, there's, a, there's a big job to be done, and I I, I anticipate, without prejudging the, the board's <laughs> deliberations, that 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 we will put quite a bit of resource into really getting this right over the next two or three years, probably. But it could be very powerful. It could it could be really very powerful. My 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 sense is that the that there's a great deal of appetite for change across all parts of this sector um, and all players in this sector. Um, and, but there is, there is a lack of leadership because leadership is, is, is sectionalised. There's leadership in land, the landowning community, there's leadership in community land Scotland, but it's, 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 it's a fragmented leadership. It's not holistic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Uh, I'd just like to ask a few sort of follow-up questions from from that, um, that discussion, um, particularly in relation to the programme of work. And I understand that, of course, you'll know, but just for the, for the record, that the work streams are expected to apply to both policy and practice, and I quote, to ident and it's important to identify changes in practice that could be implemented in the short term, leading to change and improvement on the ground. And I just wonder if you could be forthright, um, any of you, about any concerns where stakeholders um, or, or let's rephrase that. Are, are there, is, it, is it generally the case, as you've highlighted, that stakeholders are willing to participate, whether they're members of Scottish Land and Estates or whether they're in, in different organisations or not? Um, and if they aren't, how would you, how would you deal with that? And um, can, can our stakeholders be compelled to engage? Because there are... Um, there is a very unequal balance of land ownership, as we know, across Scotland, and that's part of the reason, not the only reason by any means, but part of the reason for the thrust of the, of the legislation that's come forward, um, whether one regards it as a backstop or not. So I'm interested to know how, how that is going to be developing and how, whether you've had discussions about that. Um, I think you're going to have to hear from all three of us again, I'm sorry, because I think we've all got quite clear views and, and we've done a lot of thinking. Let's start with Hamish and then maybe come to Sandra. Um, yes, and I certainly see the challenge, um, given the wide range of different interests and, and motivations involved across the work we're setting out to do here. Um, I think, as Andrew touched on earlier, our, our relationship and the collaboration with different representative bodies uh, from across the sectors um, whether that's Scottish Land and Estates, Community Land Scotland, or indeed in the urban context, uh, a completely different set of, of organisations uh, and groups. I think building strong relationships with those representative groups will help uh, significantly ensure that we, that we make that progress. There will always be outliers and individuals uh, who are unwilling to engage or, or, or simply disagree. Um, but if we're able to build that relationship with some of the key bodies, uh, and at the moment, uh, being completely honest, I think there is a a strong, genuine willingness there across the piece from, from all the organisations that we've met with. Um, we have made a point of meeting with, with many over the last few months, um, and there is a, a very genuine willingness there to, to look at how we make progress, I think. I think I'd back that up. Um, I spoke at the Scottish Land Estates annual conference this year, and it was absolutely fantastic to see the reaction, the willingness to listen and talk to us. I didn't get a cup of tea. There were so many people wanting to speak to me during the breaks. Um, but it was a genuine willingness, but obviously we know there are, there, are, there are ones that aren't in that room, there are people we need to meet that aren't in these, but I'll also say that there's been a bit of persistence from our side, so um, we work hard to make contacts, and if we don't get a meeting on our first contact, we try, and sometimes it takes a third attempt, but we have been lucky to start building it, building it up. Can I just add, um, there's, it, it's, it's enormously important that we that we get that we can reach the whole landowning community. I just want to re-emphasise that it's a real challenge for us because um, a lot of landowners don't live in Scotland, 
um, a lot are not engaged in these things. It's a real challenge, um, and, and we need all the help we can get. But the message to the landowning community is that the Scottish Land Commission is there to help them. We're not there. Uh, it, it is not in the interest of, a, of any landowner to have a situation where the Scottish people are uncomfortable with the relationship between the people of Scotland and the landowners of Scotland. That's not in, in any landowner's interest. So we're, you know, we're all in this together, in, in, in perhaps from different perspectives, and the challenge for this organisation, and for me in particular, is to, is to get out and really communicate with these people and find ways of doing that. But I, you know, what I have found is that when I, when I communicate with people and, they, and, they, and we sit down and we talk, um, there's an appetite to, sh to shift very quickly. Um, I'll give you a very specific case. You'll be aware of the case in One Lock Head. You were involved, uh, yeah. are involved, um, very helpfully. Um, what's absolutely clear about that is that there's a major communication breakdown on, uh, uh, and that, 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 that parties are not thinking the thing through properly. Um, uh, I had a number of conversations over the weekend with, I'll, I'll not, not name the parties, uh, and I'm very optimistic that we can make progress there. But it was just, you know, you know, it, we were not talking to each other. There was a, it was a breakdown of communication. That's helpful. Thank you. And, and uh, uh, it's already been highlighted this morning that um, I think I quote accurately that good practice should be celebrated and spread. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, um, could ask you, um, whichever of you feel it's appropriate to answer, whether the Commission will highlight examples of poor land management and uh, ownership practices and identify individuals who are considered not to be working collaboratively, uh, collaboratively either with yourselves um, or with local communities? And how, how will that process develop if it indeed you've had those discussions? Um, let me use the Ag Holdings to illustrate it because our thinking's slightly embryonic going uh, more widely than that. But under, uh, under the Ag Holdings, there will be, there already are codes of practice put in place. Uh, uh, it is open to people to allege that, those, that, that someone has breached that code. If that is the case, evidence will be gathered, there may well be a hearing, and the Commissioner will decide whether it's true or not. If it is true, they will, that, that will be made public. They will, in short, be named and shamed. There will be no ambiguity about that, absolutely none. In terms of a wider best practice programme going forward, it has to be integral to that programme that we celebrate good practice yeah. and we call out bad practice. It has to be integral. Now, exactly how we do that, I don't know. The board's going to spend a lot of time at probably the December meeting trying to thrash out exactly how to do that, so I don't want to prejudge that. But it must be integral to this, that you, that you celebrate good and you call out bad. I absolutely agree with that. Just uh, coming on this, we, we do seem to be focusing on uh, rural land here um, in terms of engagement. Can I explore with you in terms of derelict urban land, how in practice you're going to engage with faceless companies who are land banking? Um, I'll start on this because I have some involvement through my, I, I chair Scottish Canals uh, as well. Uh, Scottish Canals uh, is, is in, in essence the Scottish Government's wholly owned regeneration company in some ways. Um, What we have found there is that it's very difficult to, to get to the ultimate owner, but what you can do through, through working very closely with local authorities is that you can still uh, exert pressure. Now, I, I, I think we have to be honest and say that um, if you take, without naming individual owners, if you take a site uh, not far north of Buchanan Street bus station, which is derelict and, and disused, which is zoned for housing, um, which is perfectly developable, but the owner is holding out, of a bit of it, is holding out for uh, what I would suggest is more than is reasonable. Um, I don't think a voluntary code will deal with that. Mm. Uh, and, uh, so I, th I think let's, let's be clear, uh, non-statutory leadership has a very, very important role to play. It is not the only answer here. And, uh, and I don't want to even suggest it will be half our work. It, it might be. But it's, there's going to be a big, big programme of robust, evidence-driven, uh, thoroughly researched uh, n n uh, uh, reviews without preconception, leading to clear uh, recommendations to ministers, setting out options for statutory or other change. And nobody should be in any doubt about that. 
I mean, in relation to vacant and derelict land in particular, there are, there are two parts of our work programme I think that are very relevant there. You'll, you'll see we're proposing to look at uh, the housing land supply market um, and in particular the role of land banking so that we actually develop an understanding of where and how that is an issue. Um, and then alongside that, working very closely with local authorities um, on vacant and derelict land. Um, and I think part, part of our work there is wanting to actually understand the causes and the reasons behind that. And in some cases, it'll be ownership constraints. Uh, in other cases, it will be clearly be much wider issues such as contamination and, and wider um, economic issues. So I expect that we'll be able to identify some vacant and derelict land where it may be easier to make progress uh, and some where we need much longer term. Uh, okay. Charlotte Reynolds. I, I just wanted to finish up by um, reassuring you that um, it's definitely on our agenda and actually our meeting in November, if I'm correct, we're actually going to Glasgow and we're going to visit some sites and we're going to hold our, our meeting there. As you'll appreciate, we've been a bit busy up till now to get out and about during our board meetings, but we will be starting to go out once a quarter and our first is to Glasgow. Okay, thank you for that. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. <clears throat> Can I move you on to some of the bigger picture issues around your objectives and uh, wider issues affecting your future? <clears throat> Let's look at Brexit, for example. What assessment have you made of the effect on Brexit on your objectives for the longer term? Um, as I indicated earlier, we have not uh, as yet, and, and we probably will not necessarily do a really in-depth piece of work because there's no point in duplicating it. What we're clear about is that Brexit is a major factor in all of this. It's put a huge uncertainty into the equation. It's particularly, potentially, particularly challenging for upland rural areas rather than rather than the the, the urban areas. So, it's it's an it's a really important piece of context, but it's not an area of what, what, where we've done. Or, or are likely to do a detailed analysis. We will, we will rely on other people's analysis. <clears throat> and, and to what extent do you rely on top-level briefings with specialist civil servants within the Scottish Government who are involved in European strategy? Um, we, we certainly um, rely on keeping close contact with uh, central government civil servants um, in, in a whole range of policy areas, including Brexit. I mentioned earlier that we had um, the civil servant leading the Brexit agriculture research to the Tenant Farming Advisory Forum a couple of weeks ago to brief that group um, on some of the likely implications for the agricultural sector. Um, and similarly, um, through other sectors, I think we'll be keeping in touch with them um, to keep appraised of, of likely implications. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I move you on then to your objectives? Um, your three objectives, uh, productivity, diversity and accountability, I mean, are all very worthy. I mean, no one really would disagree with that. But let's drill down to the detail, and perhaps I'll ask Mr. Thin to look at this one uh, particularly. If you take the issue about uh, diversity, um, how are you going to uh, fulfil that objective? Because, Mr. Thin, you've always said to this committee that you want to proceed by consensus. But if you take the issue of land reform, for example, but we all know um, the history, and you don't need me to do anything on the history books, but if you look at... Um, egg, which I know well, in fact, was at the uh, official launch there 20, I think 20 years ago on a much younger version of myself. Um, and Neudart, um, the Highland Land League, Battle of the Braes. The, so the history of, of land reform has been about conflict. We have a finite re resource. If it's going to be about redistribution, you, some people will lose land, others will gain. I take the point, obviously, that local authorities through community empowerment might transfer resources and assets, and that's a good thing. Um, but how are you going to proceed by consensus when you're effectively in a position which has had conflict in its roots for 100 years? Well, we won't always proceed by consensus, but we won't proceed if we always proceed on the basis of conflict either. Um, I, I, I'm absolutely clear that, that, that um, uh, broadly speaking, uh, it is possible to make huge progress without conflict. But there will be times when there are when, when people's objectives and priorities conflict. So, as I've indicated, we will we will put a lot of resource into non-statutory leadership, and I believe we can achieve a great deal with that. But we will also put an awful lot of resource into reviewing the statutory tools available to elected authorities, local or or, or Scottish mm -hmm. government, to use. Uh, I'm not going to prejudge what those tools tools are because we're we're you know we're a long way from concluding what those tools are. Mm -hmm. Could I just say briefly about, a bit about diversity, though, because I think it's important to be clear that land reform is not all about community ownership. I think that's an important point to be clear about. Uh, it sometimes gets the two, at an, a public meeting I held in Oban about a month ago, it became a discussion about community ownership. 
Um, so I think we'd be careful there. Diversity is important because diver from diversity comes innovation, and from innovation comes economic growth. Uh, so it's very imp it is important, and diversity is about significantly more. Now, uh, diversity will at times mean disaggregation. It may it may well, but it doesn't necessarily mean disaggregation either. I think we also have to keep an open mind about where where is where are economic economies of scale, for example, mm. useful. Um, but let me just close on that by just drawing again on my agricultural experience. Um, the future of, of agriculture in Scotland depends on innovation more as much as anything else. Brexit, of course, is hugely important, but, but we need to innovate in that industry. Um, we are most likely to achieve that if we can get new blood and new ideas into that industry, mm. and we are most likely to achieve that by creating a greater diversity of tenure mm. in, in that sector. Mm. Mm. <coughs> I mean, clearly I'm not suggesting that you see conflict as one of your objectives. I'm, I'm really remarking on my experience in history. Uh, I mean, if you take Egg and Noidart, I mean, Noidart, as you, own, as you know, historically was owned by um, a supporter of Hitler um, pre-war. Uh, and it was immense, it took immense conflict before where there was a community buyout. And Egg um, had a similar difficult background. Do you feel you've got the strength of legislation to achieve the objectives that you need uh, to achieve your very worthy objectives? Um, no, I, I mean, there's no. You know, I, I would be quite surprised if we were to conduct all these various bits of research and conclude that there's no no change required. That would be quite surprising. Um, uh, the Scottish people are, to some extent, indicating that they think change is required. Um, I, I, but what I'm not going to do is prejudge any of that until we've really thought it through. And, and again, while emphasising that diversity is not necessarily just community ownership. On, on community ownership, we've identified a very specific work stream, looking at whether the tools currently available are sufficient. So we'll be able to answer, answer that question. Mm. Um, but the one lockhead example is a very good example. It's not, a, it's not statutory tools that are necessarily the problem there, it's just communication. Mm -hmm. Mm. And final point, uh, convener. Um, some, some have argued that one of your objectives should be um, more idealistic, which is that um, land reform, and I know my colleague uh, John Scott's touching on that later, um, is about an extension of human rights um, to have adequate uh, employment, uh, uh, to look at housing, um, to look also at positive mental health. Is that one of the philosophical objectives that you would subscribe to as well? Maybe Dr Reynolds is best to answer that. Well, you, we haven't got it as one of our four objectives, but we do hope that it comes into all of our work. And we are very, very lucky to have Megan McInnes as one of our commissioners. Mm -hmm. And she's actually already, one of our meetings has held um, a briefing from her to us all. Um, so we do hope that it's there in everything we do um, through it all. Okay. Thank you, Kibia. Yes, Mark Roscoe. Sustainability sits then within the objectives, productivity, diversity, accountability, the priority areas and long-term outcomes. It's integral to the whole thing. I mean, it must be. There's no question of that. But it's not explicit. Um, How well, are you interpreting sustainability through these objectives? Um, it's not explicit because it's because it goes right through the whole thing. I, I take the point. Maybe it would be helpful for it to be explicit, but it's... It, it's integral to the whole thing. Do you, do you see the driver of that coming from the land responsibility statement? Or? Well, and, and other, other, other areas of, of government policy, the land use strategy, for example. Right, okay. uh, John Scott. Um, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I'm just wondering if you're in a position to tell us, uh, with regard to the guidance on engaging communities in decisions relating to land, uh, there was a consultation on that, and the final guidance we were told would be laid before the Scottish Parliament in the summer of 2017. Um, have, you, um, have you an input into that? When are we likely to see that? Um, as far as I'm aware, I understand that's due to come forward in the new year um, from the Scottish Government. And yes, uh, the Government have been clear that as with the Land Rights and Responsibility Statement, they see a role for the Land Commission in providing ongoing advice on the implementation of that. Um, one of the early bits of work that we're doing that will sit alongside that, I think, is a bit of research to actually look at how we effectively monitor and gauge the level of community involvement um, so that we can actually have some idea of whether we're making progress on that particular theme. Mm -hmm. Can I follow through on that one, please? Um, th this, is, this is an area of concern to, to, to the farming community. Um, 
and I think we have to, we're going to need to get this one right. Uh, I, I have um, embarked on a program of meetings with area NFUS boards and, and committees. And there is an anxiousness in the farming community that uh, our duty to consult could become extremely cumbersome. Uh, and while it is entirely reasonable that if uh, any landowner or farmer is making a decision that impacts on other people's lives, it's reasonable there should be a sensitivity and a dialogue around that. We do, we, we need to, we'll need to work through how in practice this is going to be implemented without becoming a, a, you know, a, ser a, a serious constraint. Thank you. And I should, of course, have declared my interest as a farmer and as a member of the NFU. Um, but thank you for your answer. Thank you. Can I just explore um, something else at this point? Obviously, your work is attracting a degree of media attention. And um, I think it was last week there was a pre uh, predictable, perhaps, reaction to the uh, revelation that you were commissioning a piece of work uh, to look at how other countries had restricted the amount of land that could be in the hands of one person. Um, am I right in thinking that under ECHR, even if legislation of that type was introduced, it couldn't apply retrospectively? Um, well, I'm not. A, I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, 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 clearly, ECHR is a factor in all of that. Um, uh, I think. I think. I think. I, I, I can't give you a definitive answer at this stage. It's too early. It's a key dimension to the, to, to, to the research, and, it will, and, and we'll, you know, clearly we will draw that out. Can, can I just respond on the wider Absolutely. media point? Yeah. Um, there, I mean, I have to admit to a slight sense of frustration with some of the media coverage. Um, it's a, you, know, we, you know, we're serious people trying to do a serious job. Uh, and it isn't helpful, frankly, when a, you know, that kind of, of coverage. There was another piece of coverage in the Sunday Mail on land value taxation. Um, what, it's, what it's told me loud and clear is that we are going to have to work even harder to get out there ourselves and communicate directly, and that's what we're going to do. It was partly because of some of that that I went to see David Johnson to get some help in communicating directly with landowners outside of Scotland, mm -hmm. because uh, I am anxious that um, landowners who own, people who own land in Scotland but don't live here are getting a, a very skewed perception of this. So I, I, I think we should be very uh, very clear about this that the, you know that is not only unhelpful but is a real challenge for us and we're going to have to work at it okay thank you uh, kate forbes thank you um just a brief question i understand that the commission is preparing an uh, annual operating plan outlining the the schedule of work and um, associated resourcing and performance management big question maybe the biggest question in all of this is how will you effectively <coughs> measure um, what you're achieving in your priority work areas. I mean, do you have accurate baseline data to go on? <coughs> uh, something like engagement and communications is a very challenging area to measure. So how are you going to um, measure the effectiveness of your work? One of the great things is we've got uh, extremely well-trained academic people, so I'm just going to pass to them. Maybe Hamish first and then Sally. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think there are at least two levels to that, and clearly within our annual operating plans we'll identify some KPIs that give us an ongoing kind of measure of progress. Um, but I think more fundamentally than that, um, at our conference last week actually, Professor Sarah Skett from SRUC laid down a pretty blunt challenge to us and everyone else about how do we know we actually make an impact, um, particularly for communities that are not already active and able to take advantage of existing mechanisms, etc. Um, so internally we started looking at um, uh, what we'll need to do to actually commission some independent analysis of progress against our outcomes over a three to five year timeline. Now, clearly very early days in thinking that through, but I think it's going to be a combination of, of the internal kind of KPI work and actually getting some external quite in-depth analysis. Um, and then the, the final part, obviously part of our existing work programme for the, the remainder of this financial year uh, is actually getting some baseline data in place, um, particularly in relation to the outcomes that we've set out in the plan. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the easy answer is there's a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> we don't have all the baselines, you're quite correct, and it is the biggest question. But we are very, very lucky to have a very good team, and this is one of the, the first things we're going to have to do. When will the first um, operating plan be published? It'll be agreed and published in March for, the, for March. the coming financial year. Thank you. John Scott. 
Um, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, could I just ask you uh, your views on uh, the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement? And do you feel it strikes the right balance between rights and responsibilities? Is it simple? Is it clear enough? Is it understandable? Um, part of the ECHR stuff looks quite complicated to me. Uh, you may or may not be aware that we published uh, our, some advice to government on this in, uh, after the first round of consultation, and we put it up on our website. Everyone's well aware of it. It's in the public domain. Um, and we emphasised in that advice the importance of clarity, clear, uh, accessibility, and all the rest of it. And we think that the second version is a big step forward in that respect. Um, the, the next step for us is to figure out um, how do we help people actually interpret and use that statement? And we're going to do quite a bit of work, and I'm going to just ask Hamish to say, it's, it's early days, but a wee bit more about what we hope to do to try and help people use what's now been published. Yes, I mean, picking up the, the human rights aspect that you cast there, I think we, we recognise one of the useful roles we could do in the short term is actually start to explore uh, in a bit more detail what the understanding of, of that human rights context means in practice. Um, so one of the early things we're doing this financial year is commissioning a series of discussion papers on key topics to actually kick off um, some of the work streams and, and engage people in thinking through these topics a bit further. Um, we've commissioned one of those on human rights, um, really as a, a way of starting to understand how can land reform take forward the, the economic, social, cultural, human rights uh, dimensions that are set out in the, the rights and responsibilities statement. So I think. Through things like that, through providing discussion papers, guidance and, and ongoing advice, we hope to be able to tease out what some of those uh, principles mean in practice. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, can I take you on to uh, land for housing and development? And you've identified three key work streams. Now, we've touched earlier on the issue of urban vacancy and dereliction. So let's focus on land assembly and public interest-led development. Could you paint a picture for us of what that looks like? Good examples, bad examples. Um, I'm going to take you back to North Glasgow, if that's all right. It seems a good place to start. Um, the great deal of work done by uh, Glasgow City Council uh, and Scottish Canals. I'm sorry to wave that flag, but I will. Um, a, to master plan the development of a huge swathe of North Glasgow. Um, and um, actually a great deal of, of progress will be made over the next few years there because the public agencies have some of the tools to, to lead and drive uh, 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 the development and regeneration of that area, which includes the public agencies actually acquiring some of the land in order to make it happen. Um, but the big question in, 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 in all of that is, um, have we got enough tools in Scotland to do that? And um, wh what we know is that um, Germany has a different set of tools, uh, and they do a go about this in a different way. And they, they've got a lot of experience of dealing with derelict land because we, we, we presented them with a lot of derelict land during the war. And um, they, so they developed these tools and these expertises. So the question we need to ask is, uh, are the tools that we have at the moment sufficient? And the evidence would suggest possibly not. And uh, if not, what, you know, what, 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 what tools might be helpful? Now, I'd, I'm not going to prejudge that because it's very important that we come at everything uh, without preconception, without prejudgment. But we will do that in a thorough way. OK, but having, having heard you say that, I'm going to try and put you on the spot. There is a proposal I've heard kicking about from academia that in an urban setting, if someone was to purchase a piece of land or a building and leave it derelict for a period of time, essentially land banking till they get their way, that a power, compulsory purchase power, could be introduced to allow in the public interest for that building to be bought if it hasn't been utilised within a certain period and for the figure that was paid for it. Is that the kind of thing we're looking at? Yes, we'll certainly be looking at those sort of ideas and solutions. Um, Clearly, there are a number of things um, Scottish Government's already committed to looking at compulsory sale orders, which may form part of that picture. Uh, we've already spoken with the team that are looking at review of compulsory purchase order work. Uh, we've identified some work on land value capture, which may look at alternative ways of actually capturing the investment to make some of that happen. Um, and of course, there's also the, the right to buy dimension, particularly with abandoned, uh, neglected, mm -hmm. or vacant and derelict uh, land. 
Um, so the introduction of the, the new right to buy under the Community Empowerment Act, we need to see how that plays out in perhaps unlocking uh, development of some of those sites where, where it's appropriate for a community body to take that forward. Okay. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Thurner, or you? No, no I, I, the only thing is, that, you know, let's, let's, let's not leap to conclusions. Let's really learn from what's happening in other places and think, think this through. That's my, own, my only plea in all this. Sally Reynolds. Um, possibly Conti to our earlier discussions. For me, um, it's very po important to remember that this is actually a rural as well as urban problem mm -hmm. rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, absolutely, but I just did want to get that example on the record. Um, moving on, John Scott. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, I've been um, given and asked for a series of questions um, about meeting deadlines uh, and, and how does the Commission propose to assess the extent of scale and concentration of land ownership by the end of 2018-19 when the land register will not be completed before 2024? I think it's probably important to emphasise there that what we're looking to do is to actually understand the uh, the impacts and implications behind scale and concentration. We're not looking to carry out a full survey of Scotland's land ownership and, and quantify exactly uh, the numbers. I think that, that work is ongoing. Clearly, the, the more complete the land registry, the easier it will be for us to do that. Um, but we can take forward that work, um, for example, using case studies, examples, taking uh, a look at areas of Scotland um, to start to get behind some of the headline statistics and actually understand how does scale and concentration affect uh, the way land is used, the way decisions are made, um, and the opportunities um, associated with that. Okay. Um, further, can I ask you how best practice guidance will impact on the prevalence of charitable status in land ownership if it continues to remain a legal and viable route for the avoidance of inheritance and other tax? What's your thinking on that? Um, well, without repeating uh, the earlier discussion, I, I, I'm quite clear that best practice does change behaviours. Guidance changes behaviour, best practice and all the rest of it changes behaviours. We've seen it already in our holdings. Will it change the number of estates held uh, under charitable status? Not necessarily, and that's not necessarily uh, where we're trying to go with that. Um, the, uh, the, the reason why that's been put in as a priority in the programme for government, I think, is, is not so much to... to to necessarily reduce the number of states held through charitable status, but to ask the question, if it is held through char charitable status, you know, how do we make sure that the public interest uh, is, is, is fully um, fulfilled? Right, That's which certainly leads on to my next question. And given that the recent programme for government undertook to publish further information on the reform of succession law in 2018, the Commission will work with the Scottish Government to ensure that this reflects their vision for a fair, inclusive and productive system of ownership. Um, how do you see this? What's, what's your vision for fair, inclusive and productive system of ownership? How would you define that? Um. Well, I'm not. I, I, I'm starting to link this to the succession question. Just could you, can you can you elaborate the question a bit? Sorry. Um, it's it's the government have um, said that they will bring this forward uh, a fair, inclusive, and productive system of ownership um, in terms of succession law. Uh, what would your vision be for a fair, inclusive, and productive system of ownership? Given that you will certainly be informing the government's view. Um, I don't think we've got a clear... I mean, we have not discussed succession, succession law. It's not... I, I'm, I'm only aware of it from the Ag Holdings Review, actually, so I, I, I can't really answer that at the moment. It's too early, sorry. OK, thank you. Um, and finally, um, how does the Commission propose to assess the effectiveness of current community right-to-buy mechanisms by the end of 2018-19 when regulations for the right-to-buy, abandoned, neglected and detrimental land have yet to be laid and there is currently no timetable for implementing the right-to-buy land to further sustainable development? Well, I think the, the focus on that is on reviewing the existing, uh, particularly the 2003 Act uh, rights, so the community right to buy and the crofting community right. Um, now, I, I think in doing that, we will usefully be able to inform the way the next, the further two rights are rolled out and implemented. 
So I anticipate if we do that in the short term, uh, we will be able to feed back some of the, the learning from that and where it's got to uh, into how those other two rights uh, are implemented. Okay, thanks very much. Don Cameron. And can I refer to my registered register of interest as an owner of a land holding in the Highlands before I ask this question? Um, on, on that um, last question, I think it'd be fair to say that huge tracks of last year's Land Reform Act are not yet in force. And in fact, the, the key elements that are in force are the establishment of the Commission and the statement of land rights and responsibilities. And I just wondered, um, what's your view on, on the fact that we, we have, in, in essence, legislation that has been enacted but is not yet in force? Is that inhibiting you? Um, do you need a pause before that's brought into place? I mean, just what's your general take? Um, this is a long-term process. Uh, I, I mean, I do not, I think it's important that we just go at this systematically, calmly, uh, methodically, logically. It's not holding us back at all. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't expect to have come up with all the answers and resolved all this by the end of next year. Um, sorry. Uh, and actually, I think it's really important that we do. I think, you, you know, you can, you can look at this two, two ways. You can say, oh, it's all a bit slow, or you can say it's being done carefully. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mark Roskell. Thank you, convener. So, I mean, we have the the initial work programme, uh, which is welcome to see, and there's a lot of priorities in there. What, what's the next step beyond this work programme? What other aspects will you be focusing on in the period, new themes or perhaps developing themes beyond this initial work programme? Well, I'm, I'm not expecting particular new themes to, to emerge in the short term. I mean, the, the next steps in the immediate future are actually delving into the work that's required to deliver the work streams that are set out in here. Uh, and you'll appreciate that what's set out in here is still a fairly headline level, and, and in each of these there are several bits of work that we are now starting to put in place. For example, on the vacant and derelict land or the community right to buy review, uh, we're now starting the process of actually the, at, a, at a project level of how we take those individual bits of work forward. That's clearly going to be informed by the, the board discussions that we referred to earlier, where we're going out and about and seeing the relevant examples on the ground uh, and speaking to other um, partners. Um, and the continued public engagement. So it's really uh, fleshing out how, how in practice we take this forward now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and to make Hitch's life more difficult, we do go out and about a lot. And for example, last week at the conference, we held three workshops and we threw together the information, which is then going to be summarised and then used to help expand on the work we do. Mm -hmm. So new things are coming all the time, but we are trying to remain very focused and strategic. Okay, and can I just turn to the, the planning review? I mean, I noticed that you made a submission to the planning review. Can you just say a little bit more about what, your, what, your, your, what you see as your role in relation to that? Um, the, uh, the link between planning and, and, and our work, particularly in urban Scotland, is very, very, uh, and I hope it's obvious, but it's very important. Um, we therefore thought it was really important. We, we will not normally be you know, routinely responding to every consultation the government produces, but we thought it was important to publish that, to, to, to respond, but also to publish that response. We did that. We will continue to have dialogue with Scottish government planning officials as, uh, as this whole thing rolls, rolls forward, and Hamish is already doing that. Um, but we're not going to take over their, their function. OK. I mean, I noticed in your, in your submission uh, to the planning review, you did raise some very interesting points, including the point that communities are starting to feel that the plan-led system is being undermined by the appeals process. Um, now, that's a, an interesting and quite a weighty conclusion. Um, so, I mean, it comes back to, to, you know, how you see planning and, you know, what, what role you see going forward. I mean, it seems to be a, an area a little bit like agricultural subsidies where you've got one foot in the door. You have a view, you have a responsibility to liaise with stakeholders. It seems pretty pivotal um, to the future of land, and yet I'm struggling to really get a sense of whether this is a major strategic priority, something which you'll continue to kind of put your oar into and, and you know, quite gratefully, you know, bring forward the views of communities into that process as well. But I'm struggling to see how central it is to your to your work. Um, land, land reform has implications for a, a, an extraordinarily diverse range of, of public policy. 
uh, and, 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 and a, a significant number of the big priorities of today, planning reform, housing, all these sorts of things. Um, and I hope we do sometimes have weighty things to say, and when we have got weighty things to say, we'll, we'll not be afraid to say them, which is what we've done. But we do have to be careful. We're a very small NDPB, um, and it's important that we focus and prioritise. And that's, that's probably been one of the biggest early priorities for the board, is to, is to decide what we're not going to focus on. So, so in relation to the planning review, I think it was right to make the contribution we did, because I hope we did have something sensible to say and, and useful to say. But I don't think it would be right for us to go, you know, to divert resources into, in, into take, going too much further with that, because you know, we have a civil service and we have a planning division within civil service who can take that forward. Um, it is entirely open to them to, to talk to us about that and, and, and vice versa, and that happens all the time behind the scenes, and Hamish does that. But I don't, I, I, you know, it, the temptation for us to get heavily involved in a lot of different things is one we should resist. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, just following on from that, um, I think it was touched on earlier. Uh, the land use strategy was mentioned, and I wonder. Um, I'm listening carefully, um, Andrew, to what you're saying about uh, not getting involved in everything, uh, but and, and respect and understand the point you're making. I'm wondering uh, whether you see a, a value in the land use strategy and whether the fact that it isn't statutory at the moment but it only has to be referred to is um, relevant in terms of your work. Hamish has got a lot of experience. I'll pass to Hamish. Yeah. So I certainly see a strong value in the land use strategy, um, uh, and I think the more... Uh, we're able to articulate what the public interest is in land use, the easier it is to resolve many of the issues that we've talked about. So I think it's got a, a clear role in that. Um, and I think our, we, we see our work, and particularly the area of work we've identified as land use decision making, being strongly linked to the, the aims and objectives set out in the land use strategy. And I think perhaps what we can bring to this is, is that additional focus on the mechanisms of, of how uh, the structures of land ownership and management can help deliver some of those aims um, within the land use strategy. And do you see the fact that it isn't statutory but just has to be referred to at the moment as something that is helpful or unhelpful? I, I don't see that as holding things back or making a difference. I mean, I, I think there's very widespread support amongst all the groups that we work with, to be honest, for the idea of the land use strategy and actually quite a strong commitment to, uh, to try and move it forward. Thank you. Uh, Donald Cameron. Um, I've got just a couple of questions. Um, the first is just... Uh, in respect of the title of this committee, which is, of course, um, the Environment and Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. And in terms of climate change, could you tell the committee how the commission, um, how has the commission considered how it is contributing to uh, Scotland's climate change targets? Uh, not explicitly, no. It's implicit, it's implicit in a number of areas that we're uh, likely to be working in, but it's not an explicit area of priority uh, that we've focused on, no. Can I ask, going back to some of the questions that have been raised um, before now, um, it, I think it's fair to say that one of the biggest landowners in Scotland is the state in its many guises, uh, be that state agencies such as the Forestry Commission, uh, the government itself, um, Scottish Canals, I'm sure, um, the Ministry of Defence, Crown Estate, who we heard evidence from last week. To what extent does that factor in your thinking in terms of things like land valuation tax, uh, cap on acreage, etc. cetera? Uh, well, I, um, we've not said anything about a cap on acreage. I just want to resist, react to that, sorry. Well, um, sorry. No, may, maybe I mean, the Telegraph it, did, it, but it, we it, certainly it, didn't. In terms of, uh, no, I, I'm not, not suggesting you did, but in terms of, of, of diversity of ownership, if I could put it like that. Well, I'm going to pass this to Hamish, but sorry, just for the record. Um, we, we've talked about diversity, we've not talked about disaggregation, and we've not talked about caps. I just want to, we, we have been clear that it is an important priority to try and diversify ownership for a number of reasons, not least of which is the whole business of, of innovation, uh, uh, inclusion, and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't conclude from that anything at the, this stage. I do want to get that on the record. We're, 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 we're not going at this with, with any preconception. But sorry, to the substance of your question, I'll pass to Hamid. I'm sorry, could you just go back to the start Yes, no, I just, um, the, um, what I was asking about was obviously the state, if I could put it yeah, like that, yes. is, is, a, is a large landowner. I just wondered to what extent that factors into your thinking on, on your various um, uh, themes that you're exploring. 
Yeah, I mean, I think across the themes, we're, we're making no prejudgments or, or distinctions between types of ownership. Um, as far as I'm concerned, our work will look at these issues in relation to all types of ownership, um, be that private, public, charitable, or community. Uh, the same themes, I think, are relevant across all sectors. There's something that was said earlier. Corey Beamish. I just want to come back to uh, the area around climate change and public sector um, reporting duties. And uh, as a new organisation, um, obviously your commission isn't on the list of those that have a mandatory responsibility to report under the Climate Change Act, um, which came in um, in, the last, in the last session of Parliament. And I'm wondering whether you would see going forward, um, perhaps not immediately, but um, in, in the future, in view of the very wide remit in terms of, of land and land ownership and sustainable development, which my colleague um, Mark Ruskell highlighted, whether you would see it as useful to um, move towards reporting voluntarily on that and whether, um, as you're a new organisation, whether it would be appropriate for um, the um, Land Commission to be um, added to the list of those that um, should report on a statutory basis. Um, the, the context, for, the context for, for, for our work is and will always be the priorities of the government of today. So clearly, uh, for, for the, uh, certainly for the time being, climate change uh, uh, objectives is a high part of that. So that drives up, uh, that and other uh, Scottish government priorities will drive our strategic thinking. Mm. They will therefore drive our annual reporting as well. Um, whether uh, the extent to which we'll be explicit, I, I, I don't want to prejudge that at the moment, and therefore the extent to which um, it would be helpful. Uh, it's, it's hard for me to judge, but I think if the committee considered that it would be helpful, we'll certainly do it. That's, you know, that's not a problem. I, I simply think that it is a, a, a really positive opportunity in that you are a new organisation with significant um, remit in relation to the future of our land in Scotland. So to, to take that, and of course I respect that there are other wide-ranging wide issues to take into account, but it is something which, um, if I may suggest, you might possibly be a leader on in the future, having been involved with um, public sector reporting duties for the last committee. We'll do that, thank you. Um, I, I, I emphasise, I, we will be extremely anxious to report our contribution to, to a, the, the whole spectrum of Scottish government priorities, precisely because we, we, we have a really important job to do over the next few years, which is to, is to really... Um, communicate the significance of land and land reform to, to the welfare of, of, of our society in all sorts of ways. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, have members got any other questions, any other areas that they wish to cover? Are we content with that? Okay, well, it just remains for me to thank you for your time this morning. That's been very useful. If anything does come to mind, feel free to write to us. And I think we would also encourage an ongoing dialogue. So uh, regular updates of, of anything of relevance to the committee when in writing would be helpful, I think. We'll, 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 we'll absolutely do that in, in writing uh, and, and also would very much welcome an opportunity to do this from time to time. Yeah, thank you, okay. thank you very much. I'm going to suspend very briefly uh, before we move to the rest of the business.
Uh, welcome back to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We move to Agenda Item 3, which is subordinate legislation, specifically the following negative instruments. The Public Water Supply Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 forward slash 281, and the Water Intended for Human Consumption Private Supply Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 forward slash 282. I uh, refer members to the papers and can I invite any comments? Uh, I'm, I'm not objecting um, uh, to this legislation. We could just flag up, um, just for the record, that effectively this delegates um, the, the UK from uh, the Drinking Water Directive, which means it could be less frequent sampling under certain circumstances of water quality. I uh, had some issues in Barnock and Chasse uh, and the nature of water quality, uh, but I would suggest that what we do when we do meet Scottish Water uh, future meeting, that we put this down as a question to them. Are we agreed to that? Uh, I see an agreement. Any other comments on these two instruments? Mark Roscoe. Concern, convener, this is the second statutory instrument we've had, which has had major drafting errors uh, within it. Um, and obviously, given the volume of statutory instruments we're likely to get next year uh, in the run-up to Brexit, um, these kind of errors do raise concerns. I don't know whether the uh, limit value errors within the statutory instrument have any material uh, impact in terms of uh, environmental quality, um, but it does raise, raise questions about drafting. And, and if this is to be an interim measure ahead of an amendment being brought forward, does that have any impact in terms of the water quality regimes in that interim period? Um, so it's something that I, I think we should perhaps raise with the Scottish Government just to get some clarity and some reassurance over um, how these instruments are being drafted and the due care and diligence that's uh, brought to that process. So uh, do, you, do you mean by that the, the general picture about drafting errors or the specific points that you've just raised your concerns around this particular SSI? Um, uh, concerns about the SSI that's been brought in front of us this morning, but it, it does follow up a, a theme. Okay, so it's the two, the two uh -huh. issues. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you. Uh, can you uh, I would just like to uh, support uh, Mark Ruskell in what he said and express my concerns about the Public Water Supply Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 SSI 2017-281. Um, and just um, hope that, that um, when the next instrument is brought forward, which of course I very much welcome, that these matters will be resolved. But I think there is a broader point here, and I think it's very important that... Um, these instruments uh, are correctly laid in the first instance. That would be hugely helpful um, for all concerned. Okay. So do we write to the government on both of these points? We are agreed. That being agreed, um, are we also agreed that we don't wish to make any uh, recommendations in relation to the instruments? And can I ask that the letter or letters to be sent in this regard uh, are delegated to myself as convener? We are agreed. Thank you for that. Okay, so the fourth item on the agenda is for the committee to consider correspondence from the Scottish Government in relation to a petition by Logan Steele on behalf of the Scottish Raptor Study Group calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to implement urgent action to introduce a state-regulated system of licensing of game bird hunting. Um, I refer members to the uh, papers and I invite uh, any responses. Okay, uh, Kate Forbes. I certainly think that we should be asking for an update from the Scottish Government as to where they are at with, in light of our previous discussions. Okay, uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, I, I would agree with that, and I think it's important. Uh, I note from the letter from the Cabinet Secretary that um, it says I'm commissioning a research project to examine both the benefits and costs of large shooting estates of Scotland's economy and biodiversity. So, um, particularly in view of um, uh, the fragility of rural economies and also the, the lack of um, uh, progress, as one might define it, towards some um, 2020 biodiversity targets. I think it will be helpful to us specifically about that as well. And then perhaps the committee, once we've heard about the um, 
how the um, review group is developing and the research could then be in a better position to make an informed decision about whether to close the petition or not. Okay. Any other views? I would be happy to keep the petition open. Um, I think that would be not unreasonable. I do think um, we would be pleased to hear from the Cabinet Secretary as well how she's progressing this request from the committee. I have to say I'm not necessarily in favour of this licensing. Um, I think it will be much more red tape, um, but I'm therefore not necessary or welcome. But let's hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say. Okay, so what I'm hearing around the table is that we should write to the government seeking a detailed update and uh, continue the petition. Is that agreed? We are agreed. Okay. Um, at its next meeting on the 31st of October, the committee will begin taking evidence as part of its inquiry into air quality and will consider subordinate legislation on land reform and wild fisheries. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery uh, be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you.